two, one, two, one, two, one, two. There we go. Can you, uh, Two, one, two. Good morning, everybody. Why don't we move forward a little bit? Good morning, everybody. We'll get started here. We have a brief speaking program as we celebrate uh, that which is so very important to those who are here today. My name is Jack Malone. I'm a member of the board of directors of Matt's mission as we endeavor to end the stigma of addiction. We welcome you back here and hope that something that happens here today, something that says is said here today, is an indication that people know that good people suffer from the disease of addiction. They need not die from the disease of addiction. And let me say very importantly, I'm a person in long-term recovery, which means I have not had a drink or drug since June 21st, 1993. The first order of business is Mike is going to play something very special that we have the privilege of having associated with this program. It's a song written by Dave Drobiak, and it's known as the Mets Mission Song. Mike?
it's time to end this misconception of the stigma of this dark addiction. The kindness shown to a broken soul can ease the burden of this heavy toll. A simple thing like a gentle act can help someone get back on track. Thank you. Thank you, Dave Drobiak, for assembling that meaningful song. First and foremost, we want to welcome a good friend of ours, Father Ted Tomicki, the pastor of St. Mary's in George City, St. Catharines in Preston, and St. Thomas in Valentown for a celebratory prayer for the success of the mission of Matt's mission and in remembrance of those who we've lost and an awareness that we hope can help to save others. Reverend Ted. Please join me in prayer. Lord God, we gather to remember lives lost to the scourge of addiction and to be mindful of those who continue to struggle. Be with us as we pray and remember. Instill within us the motivation to work for a greater understanding of those who struggle with addiction, for a greater understanding of how stereotypes, stigmas, and assumptions cause tremendous harm, and of how we can learn more and support those around us who face addiction and loss. For those struggling with addiction, grant them strength to persevere and courage to come forward and seek help. For those who provide support for recovery, bless their efforts and provide them with the means to continue support. For families, friends, and acquaintances, grant them wisdom and understanding, knowledge and good counsel. And still with all, within all of us, a greater understanding of the issues we face and the courage and strength to be supportive and to work for an end to addiction. Remind us to see the dignity inherent in each human being and to treat each person with respect and genuine concern. Amen. Thank you, Reverend Ted. A little bit of business we have to take care of this morning. So I'm gonna call up the president and founder of Matt's Mission, Kathleen Duffesey, as well as Vice President April Wojcik. Ladies. Good morning. Thank you all for being here and supporting Matt's mission. First, I would like to thank our awesome board members. They are dedicated and compassionate individuals who volunteer their time. I would also like to thank our speakers, SNSN Radio, our volunteers, resource providers, and our generous sponsors. This day would not be possible without each and every one of you here today. 
About 200 people die each day from drug overdoses, which do not even include the additional deaths caused by drug-related fatalities. Addiction is a disease that chemically alters the brain, and the faces of addiction are changing. We are making progress, but we must do more. We still treat individuals suffering from a disease like criminals. We are not going to eliminate the drugs off our streets by arresting nonviolent drug offenders. We are going to get the drugs off our streets by offering treatment and services to individuals suffering from the disease of addiction. Punishing individuals in need of treatment for a disease keeps them addicted. Decriminalization is not legalization, but the idea is to redirect enforcement resources and prevent flooding our prisons with nonviolent drug offenders. We stigmatize people every day by revealing nonviolent drug offenders' names suffering from addiction in the media, shaming them for having a disease. Let's turn the focus on the greedy pharmaceutical executives and the big dealers out there selling for profit only. We need assistance to fund beds for both mental health and addiction disorders. It should not take three days or longer to enter detox or treatment. Individuals should not be required to have substances in their system in order to obtain services or medication-assisted treatment. Our loved ones are dying waiting for services, and we must focus on easier access and immediate treatment. Treatment providers need to work with individuals and bring them back from setbacks, not discharge people who have returned to using, only release them back to the streets without the proper services, support, and treatment. We must change the way we talk, treat, and respond to addiction. We need to switch our strategy and our way of thinking and offer treatment and services, not incarceration. We must stop moralizing and blaming people with the disease of addiction and instead create opportunities for individuals and families to choose the proper treatment. Let's rebuild families instead of tearing them apart. Build trust in communities by making them recovery friendly. It is essential we provide drug education in our schools at every grade level. Our communities need to welcome, support, and educate themselves on harm reduction programs, such as the syringe exchange program. Harm reduction programs save lives and they keep our communities safe. We must offer second chance programs for employment and services for incarcerated individuals who suffer from addiction when they re-enter our communities. As my friend Daryl would say, welcome home that person released from prison and assist these individuals with the tools necessary to a lifelong path to recovery. Let's move forward as a community and work together to make the positive changes long overdue in the lives of individuals who suffer from addiction. Thank you. Today we are here for two main reasons. We are here to celebrate recovery and to honor our loved ones who have passed. I ask that we all take a moment of silence and remember those we have lost. Value your worth. In order for you to celebrate your recovery and your accomplishments, you must value your worth. One part of ourselves we tend to lose in this journey to recovery is our value. We can easily get lost and caught up by other people's opinions of who they think we are. Before long, we begin to place a higher value on others around us, forgetting our own value and worth. Today, we hope you hear our message of love and support, and we ask you to take a few minutes today and realize your own value and worth. We are all here to embrace each other's accomplishments 
to celebrate the milestones and to most importantly, recognize your value. I would like to leave you with this final quote. Your value doesn't decrease based on someone's inability to see your worth. Thank you. Thank you, ladies. I would like to bring up Todd Babbitt, the first selectman of Jewett City, uh, for some welcoming remarks. Mr. Babbitt. First of all, I want to thank everybody for coming out today. Uh, the weather cooperated. We have a cloudy day, but at least it's not raining. That held off. Um, I'm very happy to be here at the third annual Matt's Mission Veterans Park event. Uh, all of us have been touched in one way or another by the tragedy of addiction. And I guess the question I always feel people have is, how do we, how do we process this? Um, the goal of Matt's mission is to work to end the stigma associated with addiction. Through education and collaboration with law enforcement <clears throat> treatment facilities, they strive to focus on treatment rather than punishment, which I think is very important. It's a big change that uh, we're trying to put forward, and I think it's very successful. Uh, Kathy, the work that you and your team are doing is to be commended. I can say that I've learned a lot from your efforts and dedication. Um, I've attended some of the meetings that you started holding at the Patchogue Town Hall just to get a better idea on, on things going on and how things are working. And all I can say is I hope everything keeps going in this direction and that everything that you are doing is very much needed. We support Matt's missions and we thank all of you, Kathy, you, your team, everybody involved for what you're doing here. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Babbitt. Next, you want to bring up a gentleman uh, who first appeared here last year while he was on the campaign trail. And we know that in his efforts in the state of Connecticut, in the legislature, he understands what we're trying to do here at Matt's Mission and in all communities. Please welcome Brian Manu, state representative. morning. I want to thank everybody for being here on this uh, very um, solemn uh, memorial, uh, yet very important uh, remembrance of uh, this terrible, terrible public health epidemic that's affecting um, all of us. Uh, something that does not, a disease that does not discriminate um, based on socioeconomic or religious or race or sexual orientation. We're all susceptible. We, uh, we all can, for one reason or another, get addicted to um, opioids. And the battle rages on. And you, you are the soldiers and the generals that are going to be fighting this. And we will defeat this with time and perseverance. Um, each day, more than 130 people annually die from a, uh, uh, nationally die from a overdose. Over a thousand annually uh, die here in Connecticut. As you look at these uh, pictures of some of these beautiful, beautiful people uh, displayed here along the uh, field, most of them in the flower of their youth has been, lives have been taken from them. Uh, their opportunity to be here and to uh, serve their unique purpose because of this terrible, terrible academic, uh, epidemic. Uh, Matt's mission seeks to emphasize treatment and rehabilitation and healing, not arrest and incarceration. We need to end the stigma in blaming the uh, person who's addicted. Um, it's not the person who's addicted. We need, to, uh, we need to stop blaming them. We need to hold those, however, that deal to them, that uh, uh, turn them on to the, for one reason or another, 
to these, these terrible, ter this terrible, terrible disease. Those people need to be held accountable. And I want to assure Kathy Duffesey, her work over the last four years and many, many others have not gone in vain. The uh, state legislature hears you. We, uh, we, we know what's going on, and there has been some um, advancement in defeating this disease. Uh, first and foremost, uh, I was the proud uh, uh, sponsor of uh, House Bill uh, 6158, which would look to expand the uh, crisis pilot program out of Troop A in New London, which has been very successful in linking both law enforcement and mental health professionals. So when they get, when there's a call, you have that mental health professional that can immediately uh, get a person in, uh, in need, a person who has addiction to the appropriate services. Um, this has been highly successful. We want to expand that up into Troop D, up in uh, Danielson, into uh, Wyndham County. Um, I, I was honored to stand at the steps of the Youth Center this past winter with Griswold Pride, Miranda Mahoney, um, Kathy, and many, many others who have lost loved ones from this horrible disease. We, I, uh, we had a hearing, which was a great first step. Many people are interested, and I want to make a promise to Kathy and everybody else who's here. As long as I am in the state legislature, I will continue to fight and advocate for that bill until we get it across the finish line. Additionally, uh, fentanyl is the horrible, horrible poison that's exponentially more toxic, more lethal than morphine and heroin. It has, it's, it's, it's horrible. And um, just a few grains of it can, will kill a person. And I, we need to have a zero tolerance for those who are dealing and selling this to our children and to our future. And it's time to get tough on these people. Uh, Public Act 1938 does just that. Anybody caught on the first offense convict, and convicted of selling fentanyl can get up to 15 years in prison and a $50,000 fine. Um, additionally, we have Public Act uh, 191, which uh, uh, makes uh, mandates that prescribers of opioids that prescribe for more than 12 weeks have a long-term care plan that they discuss with the patient and also our pharmacists are required to discuss uh, the uh, the opioid issue uh, with uh, patients before uh, dispensing the medication. However, I recognize there's much, much more that needs to be done with this. We need to uh, continue to advocate to make sure that the uh, mental health disparity, uh, the mental health infrastructure in Wyndham County in uh, northeastern Connecticut gets on par with the rest of the state. And we will continue fighting to make sure that becomes a reality. We also need to look at expanding the quality of life task force, our narcotics task force here in the state of Connecticut, again, to hold those accountable who are killing our children and killing our future. Thank you all again for being here. God bless every single one of you. The battle continues. Thank you, Representative Lanou. Before you sat down and came to listen to us, I certainly hope that you've taken the time to walk along the hill and see the pictures of the young people that we have lost. Those are people who have been lost in Connecticut, young, best and brightest. Every one of them has an identifying value, which they all had. It is one of the most poignant reminders of why we're here today, that a life need not be lost through this addiction. John Lally is with us today. He's the executive director today, I Matter. He's a psychiatric APM and a member of the American Society of Addiction Medicine. He lost his son, Tim, to a heroin overdose. January of 2016. Since then, he has been speaking around the state about addiction and mental illness from a personal and professional standpoint. We welcome Mr. Lally. John?
Hello, good, good morning. I think it's still morning. First, I certainly want to thank uh, Kathy and Math Mission for inviting us here at this important event for, for the second year. We're proud and honored to be back here again. And I want to thank everybody that's here. A lot of the people I've seen before. You know, I, I've been doing a lot of talking lately, the last few years, at these kind of events. And you get to know all the, uh, much of your names and faces, and I say familiar people around here. And it, it's, it's a wonderful thing that we're getting together. But there's another side to this. It gets kind of frustrating, too, that when I speak, it's, you know, they use the, use the uh, colloquialism of speaking to the choir. Everybody here gets it. You wouldn't be here if you didn't get it. If you didn't know we need to talk, if you didn't know we need to share, we need to support each other. We need to, we need to everyone talks about reducing the shame and stigma. That, that's the number one uh, object of, of our organization as well. But we can't do that by just talking to each other. We need to take it out of here. We need to make it part of our daily lives. We need to talk to our families, our communities, our schools, our employers. And then in addition to that, certainly our state, local, and federal representatives. We need things to change. A couple weeks ago, I was at a rally in Philadelphia. Philadelphia, they're trying to open uh, a place called Safe House. It, it would potentially be the first safe injection site in the United States. The federal government has taken into court to stop this, to stop this. This is a program that has been used widely in Canada, many other places around the world. It has been proven to save lives. That's what we're talking about. It's proven to save lives. And we have to battle our own government. Well, they say it's illegal. It's illegal to, to watch someone doing an illegal substance. Well, the people, maybe you get it here too, you understand. Who decides what's legal and illegal in this country as far as medications, as far as substances? The FDA, right? But when you look at the history of what's legal and what's illegal, remember there was a time where alcohol was illegal, but prohibition. We actually had a national amendment to overturn that because people wanted to have their alcohol. So things could change. But when we decide in this country what's legal or illegal, when you look at the history, the reasoning is, is, is not what we want it to be. It's not what's best for people. It's about what makes money for people. It's about racial oppression. It's about ignorance of science. That's how the, the government decides what's legal and illegal. So we need to stand up. We need to change that. If we want serious difference, we need to change that. We need to all speak out. We need to take this home again. Take this out of this community, that those of us standing here, again, we all get it. And I'm proud of everyone here. People work hard. We, work, we really have good in our hearts. But I, I'm, I'm disappointed that we can't get other people to come to these events because they think it's not me, it's not my family. I don't need to worry about that. Well, look at these faces on the hill. I'm sure you have. It's us, it's our families, it's our neighbors. It's our friends, it's our, it's our co-workers, it's everybody, it's not about us and them. And we gotta convince everyone else that's not here, we gotta convince them that they need to pay attention. It wasn't that long ago, I could not have imagined anyone in my household using heroin. As has been said, my son's been dead over three and a half years ago from abusing heroin. I, I, I just was floored. That doesn't happen in my family. I don't know anybody who does that. At the time, I didn't. Boy, that's, that's opened up my world, opened up my eyes. And things are just continuing to get worse. So I implore all of you to make this bigger than what's here today. And many of you groups still, you're here, you, you have a, 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 a presentation here today, and I know you're doing wonderful things for the community. We gotta keep that up. But we gotta talk about it. We gotta stand up, every one of us, when we hear someone talk disparagingly about someone with addiction or mental illness, let them die. They get what they deserved. We all heard those things. They're just a junkie. Why should I use tax dollars to help them? They're just going to go back. Why should I give them Narcan? They're just going to overdose again. We all need to take responsibility to speak out and correct them and say, no, excuse me, you don't understand. Let me tell you a story. Let me tell you the reality of what's going on. We all know someone these days who's struggling. So we've got to take that out of here. We've got to talk to our state reps, our federal reps, our local representatives, 
We gotta talk up when we hear people talk disparagingly. We gotta go to our schools and make sure they're teaching about addiction, reality about addiction. Make sure they're teaching about mental health. Make sure they're teaching kids how to cope with stress. That stress is, is life, stress is important, but you can cope, you can talk. Let them understand that it's okay to be struggling. Every one of us struggles. So we gotta take that home, we gotta take it to our communities. That's how we're gonna make real difference as well as the programs here that are helping people who are struggling. People are always gonna do drugs. People have always done substances since they picked something out of the ground and smoked it and ate it and got high and liked how they felt. It's always gonna happen. But it doesn't have to be the deaths that there are today. We all know these drugs on the street are deadlier than ever in history. But we gotta start when kids are young. We gotta start when kids are struggling and teach them how to cope with pain, how to cope with anxiety, how to cope with depression. And that it's okay to talk about it. It's not embarrassing to say I'm struggling. We need to spread that around, okay? So I ask, what's helpful sometimes in my mind, you have something in your hand. At our table over here, so today I matter table at the bottom of the hill, we have pins that say T-I-M, today I matter. I encourage everybody to walk over and pick up one, hold it in your hand, take it home with you. And every time you look at it, feel it, wear it, remember that you matter, you can make a difference. Every one of those people in those posters, they matter, don't they? They matter today and always. We all matter, but we have to use that. We have to make a difference. A woman, we were at a rally in, in, a, in Boston a few weeks ago, and a woman who, who we happened to have in our poster project, her son, came up to me with this poster, and she said, you know, he struggled a lot growing up. He had a lot of troubles. He was really a really difficult child. But his grandfather said to him, one day, you're gonna, you're gonna mean something. You're gonna make a difference. And it suddenly hit me. Look at every one of those people up there in those posters. They are making a difference today, aren't they? In their passing, they are making a statement right now. They are out there and are saying, this is me. This is a real person who has struggled. This is not who you used to think about was a drug addict. But this is me. And I look like you, don't I? I look like your family and your community. So take one of those pins, and when you hold that in your hand, remember that you matter. And to please reach out to someone who's struggling. We all talk about shame and, and stigma. Well, people who are struggling struggle with that. They have their own self-stigma as well. They feel like my son for a while felt like he was a loser. Like it didn't matter to anybody because he couldn't overcome his disease. He felt like a loser. So reach out to people. When you see they're struggling, don't wait for them to ask. Walk over and say, it looked like you're having a hard time. You want to talk? Can I help you? I know people that help. You're not alone. Spread that message. Let's take that home today. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, John. Don't go away. John, stay right here. We know that you do what you do because out of the, the great concern in your heart, but the generous people that support Matt's mission have made it uh, their intention to give you a little something for what you do. So we want to present that to you. And thank you very much. Thank you so much. Next, I want to call upon Dominic Esposito of the Opioid Spoon Project. Dominic? Thanks, thanks. It, um, I love John, Dom, Lally. We've, um, he's right, we, it's always the same uh, people. We've been together, at a, we were down to Safe Injection site. It was a very hot day. Um, we stood out there for hours um, reading names and it was um, the same thing up in Boston. You know, we, we see him everywhere. Uh, just everyone give another round of applause for John Lally. He's just amazing. I mean, he is literally everywhere. So, um, so Kathleen reached out to me to come out here, and I wasn't quite sure um, what the message was going to be, but um, because you know we're out there, we're, we're activists. If uh, a lot of people don't know who I am, I'm the spoon guy. Most people kind of refer to me as that. In fact, it was funny. A couple of months ago, um, we kind of rolled out the spoon for this honor tour, and I, um, this lady came out of work and kind of, and I'll explain a little bit more. But she came out and frantically wanted to sign the spoon and I introduced myself hi I'm Dominic Esposito thinking she would know recognize who I am and she kind of pushed me aside and you know took the the marker and, and wanted to sign the spoon and then um, 
she's like, is the spoon guy here? And um, that, well, <laughs> so, so I do get that a lot. Um, so in all seriousness, my family struggles um, and um, pain started similar to your, the stories are similar to a lot of people here. Um, we've been dealing with substance use disorder in my family for close to 12 years now. Um, and it's really namely my brother, uh, Danny. Um, it's been a tough road. Um, he was doing well up until about um, probably around the hol uh, November, um, late November last year, and he's, he's not doing so great right now. Um, so he's not in a great place. And maybe selfishly, I'd ask everyone here to sort of say a small prayer for him later tonight um, that he um, finds a better path um, or one um, that he can at least survive. Um, so. Anyways, um, the spoon, I, I took this 800 pound spoon um, really as a symbol of accountability to point fingers at who I thought um, were the perpetrators and architects behind the opioid epidemic we find ourselves in. And we started off with Purdue Pharmaceutical back in June of last year. Um, so picture, I don't know if, if many of you have seen this thing, but it's, you know, it's 800 pounds, it's solid steel, and um, we dropped it off in front of Purdue. After that, we've done Rhodes Pharmaceutical, also owned by the Sackler family, and then in April, um, the FDA, um, for their role really in fueling the opioid epidemic. And most recently, um, we started a tour back in May where we took a blank spoon, this time with, with no opioid uh, depiction in it, and kind of used it really as a memorial. And we um, started off um, just outside of Boston and we did 10 states, 15 cities, and um, had families sign this spoon. And the whole journey was just pretty amazing and just um, humbling having had and listened to all these families' stories of pain. Um, and a lot of them, it was, it was actually, I sort of was also myself underestimated just how difficult it was going to be. Um, it, it was really tough. I mean, we met thousands of families and hundreds of organizations like the ones here today. And we're out there day in, day out, kind of battling. And sometimes it's hard to even just get out of bed and face um, the reality of what's going on and to come out and sign this thing. And it, it was really hard and really heartfelt. Anyways, that same spoon now is, is at um, where we've got it in Providence sort of as a memorial, we've really created this memorial and then we're sort of taking it around to different cities that are hosting it for a few weeks at a time. We would have had it here today, but it's, it's, in, the, it's in City Hall Plaza in, in, um, in Rhode Island right now. So I kind of want to talk a little bit about, you know, why we do what we do. Um, and it's not just pharmaceutical companies. You know, it's sort of easy to sort of point fingers, especially lately, you know, you see all the press on the Sackler family and the fines that they're going to pay. and. It's just not that simple, right? I mean, it, it, yes, it's easy to sort of pick at Purdue, but it, it really is this huge web of influence that's sort of been created in this country over the last 25 years. Um, you know, it's lobbyist firms, it's pain advocacy groups, uh, it's the medical community. You know, we've allowed, as a society, we've allowed pharmaceutical companies to not just manufacture our drugs, we've allowed them to educate our doctors, um, especially um, by funding a lot of our medical schools. We've allowed them to, to influence policy by paying off politicians with lobbyists, right? So um, that's really what we're trying to do is sort of untangle this huge web of influence that's been created over the last 25 years. And it's not going to be instant, right? I mean, we're not going to go back to where we were in 1995 right away, but we're going to try to get somewhere. I mean, we, we do, as a group, the Opioid Spoon Project, we do think that opioids as, as um, oxys do belong for acute cancer patients and in some places in use, but you can't tell me we need them for you know, a wisdom tooth being pulled. And so we're really kind of getting out there. We've been reached by a lot of groups out there that are doing some solid work to actually kind of start pulling that away um, from uh, uses that, that really aren't uh, necessary or needed. But I do want to talk a little bit about um, something that John uh, mentioned earlier, and we're, you know, Having seen John at the same rallies and the same demonstrations that we, we, we go to, um, it's become, and I'm, I'm sort of the newcomer at this, right? We've only really been at this for a year and a half. Um, it's become apparent to me that, um, that there's a lot more that we could do. And, and a lot of times we always say, you know, we and we and we. So I'm going to actually ask 
you, the audience, the people listening, to do something, really. And to really to become ambassadors for the opioid um, epidemic, really. And it's, and it's simple things, you know, I, I do it myself, like, you know, and John talked a little bit about this, but, you know, I pull people out for coffee that are, have nothing to do with that, you know, that I, you know, that are either friends from a previous career or something, and I'll just hammer them on, you know, why I think it's important, the stigma behind it, the language, and, you know, I get them to come to rallies with me, and, and they learn a lot, and then that gets passed on, right? So we really have to, as a community, kind of get out there and spread the word and not just be the activists out there, you know what I mean? It's easy to sort of, and, and, and you sort of, simp, you know, the simple, it is kind of empty. So the simple, the fact is, you know, simply, you know, here it is one person with one piece of art, what I was able to achieve and the national attention that we got, imagine what all of us can do combined, really, and we all have a special talent, whether it's social media, whether it's graphics, it's something, it's really using that talent um, as an ambassador, really, to get out there and spread the word and just not sit on your laurels and, and kind of hope that it's somebody else or some other community to do that. And um, it's, sort, it's sort of hard putting people on the spot to do that, um, but, but I think it really is necessary um, to, to get out there and, and spread the word. Um, I, that's really kind of it. I mean, I, I, I do have some leaflets around that I can sort of spread, uh, talk a little about some of what, we're, what we've been up to. But we are a 501c3. Um, we're, nas uh, we're national. We really try to get the word out. Um, our mission is not just about spreading awareness, but it's also about pointing accountability, you know, pointing fingers and accountability. But our, I sort of, there's one more thing I want to talk about, sort of the, um, the comparison that I, I think is sort of, so real is to the HIV epidemic that we had in this country back in the 80s. And if you look at what has happened there, it took them, you know, it took that community 20 plus years to get where they are, right? And if you look at where we are today in the opioid epidemic, I think we're in like 1984, 1985. Yeah, I mean, you hear people talk about it, but the stigma is out there. We don't have the Ryan Act. We don't have anything like that, right? We don't have the federal government. We don't have politicians discussing this openly, especially at the presidential level, really. So that's really what we're, we need to sort of think about. This is where we are. We're 1984, 85. And don't let anybody tell you otherwise. And that's it. Well, thank you. And I'm so humbled to be here. And thank you, Kathleen, for the invitation. Thank you, Dominic. Dominic touches on a subject I just want to tell you because I've told it to many, many people before. And I'm not that old, but it is an emblematic of how things have changed and how things have changed in a bad way. And, and he mentioned it, so I'm going to tell you my particular story. And that is, I had three wisdom teeth taken out in one day, courtesy of the United States Navy. And what I was prescribed was the strong recommendation that I gargle with salt water for the next three days. And that is the reality of it, and it didn't serve me badly. But you fast forward 40 years, and a 17-year-old gets a wisdom tooth out, and they were prescribed, really unprofessionally prescribed, 40 perks or worse. And that's become the, that was the acceptance of the medical community and the expectation of the patient community. That got away that got out of hand. It's incumbent on many of us to say that isn't the way to do things. And I don't say people shouldn't get some kind of medication for a surgery. And I, well, moderation would have helped a lot of people because we don't know how many addictions took off with that flurry of medication given to a young person who might not have needed it. Next person to speak, and we'll move along here so we can finish up before noon, but actually Shaw Giordano, a person in long-term recovery, a Red Sox fan. Good for you, Ashley. <laughs> and a member of the community speaks out. Ashley? Is anyone here a Yankee fan? Right here. <laughs> what was the score last night? Yeah, I was there. They lost. Uh, <laughs> I want to uh, take a little lighter note real quick and say I think I started fangirling over the spoon guy because he was like a faceless legend in the recovery community. I think that's amazing what you did. Um, can we give him another round of applause? I 
today on my way over here was overwhelmed with sadness and it was it was weird i was listening to a shania twain song so i shouldn't have been overwhelmed with sadness but i was thinking about i knew today i matter would be here and i was thinking about all these faces and hoping to see some of my friends up there and i did and um that's a weird thing to say but it i was thinking about how these pictures are all moments and I was looking at Ben Iliff's photo and how beautiful that photo is. And he's smiling, he looks like maybe he was laughing during that photo and after he probably continued laughing and life carried on when that photo was taken. And now it's our duty to carry on his message because that's where the photo ends now. And you know, that was, you're welcome. That was very, it's emotional, but um, I want to agree with a couple of things. First, Kathleen, thank you for having me come today. I'm very honored to be here, and I agree with the incarceration problem. I agree with the incarceration problem. I wasn't going to mention this, but my mother has been incarcerated since August 1st, 2018 to a nonviolent drug-related crime, which was possession, and she's in there till 2025. So I'm going to say that I don't know what the answer is to my mother's recovery. I've never known. I wanted to know for 20 years, but I know that's not it. And I pray to God that when she comes out from seven years of doing time for having heroin on her, that I don't have to make a poster for her. That's my prayer. Anyway, I agree with that. And I also agree with a lot of what you said about what should be legal and not legal, and I think it's illegal to allow so many people to die, hundreds of thousands of people to die and do almost nothing about it. It's just the community, thank you. And I find it crazy that there's so many people here today who are doing so much for the community, so much, more than I've ever seen in the last few years, and yet there's still expected to be an increase in overdoses this year. That blows my mind, absolutely blows my mind. But before I run out of time, I wasn't sure what I was gonna talk about today. Um, and I have a lot of these daily meditation books, a uh, couple for AA specifically. And uh, this one is specific to women, but I was going through it and I looked at today's date and I read it and I thought it was just perfect. So I wanted to read it to you guys. It's September 7th says, remember your good memories, but live for today and keep the memories behind you. The stuff of our memories comprise who we have become. Each recollection is akin to an ingredient in a simmering pot of stew. The full flavor of our lives is enhanced by each additional experience, whether it be painful or joyful. So human is our tendency to linger in thought on past times that we fail to take advantage to be fully present in the moment, which is assuredly making a necessary contribution to the total panorama of our lives. Who are we to judge the value of any single experience? It's, all, it's how all experiences have mingled that we must trust. We can be certain in retrospect that those situations that created the most inner turmoil also offered us the most as growing, developing people. The experiences offered today and the 24 hours ahead are significant because they are unique. I will cherish them for the addition they are making to my total person. That spoke volumes to me, This specifically this line. Those situations that created the most inner turmoil also offered us the most as growing, developing people. That was my addiction for me. That offered me the absolute most inner turmoil. And the beginning of my addiction was just one moment. It was that three, maybe four seconds it took for me to decide, okay, I'll try that pill. And then quickly that pill turned into heroin, which was then crack and then alcohol every day, and the progression was very fast. And addiction, I, I say addiction gave me a lot. Addiction gave me the ability to lie, steal, and manipulate my family to get what I need. It gave me hatred, sickness, soreness, handcuffs, hospital beds, Ambulance rides, shame, guilt, anger, numbness, and that all repeated over and over again. It was like Groundhog Day in hell. That's what addiction gave me. And then there was a moment where I decided to come into recovery. And there, I feel like there were so many moments I decided to come into recovery and I just couldn't get it. I kept relapsing, but I don't know exactly what the one moment was, but there was one moment where I decided this was it. 
and this is the last time I'm beginning recovery and I'm going to stay in recovery. And now recovery has given me so much healing, growth, peace, happiness, family, strength, serenity, confidence to be up here speaking. I couldn't do, I couldn't even speak in front of 20 people when I went to my first rehab. Okay. So this recovery gave me this confidence for sure. Compassion, forgiveness, support, community, courage, bravery. It gave me a life map and life coaches and the program that I work. It gave me my life back, you know? It gave me a better life than I had before, and I'm very grateful. So that, that one defining moment, right, where I tried that pill for the first time, that took me through probably the worst times of my life. But if that hadn't happened, I wouldn't be here today, and I wouldn't be who I am today. And I am very proud of who I am today. I know my worth today. Today I matter. I know that very much. So I wanted to hope that we all live knowing that like this very moment right now could also be that impactful for all of us. So thank you. Very nice, Ashley. Good job. Is Daryl McGraw here? Where's Daryl? He here? What happened to Daryl? We see him, if you see him, tell him he's to come up here. He's supposed to speak. Next is Maddie D. Maddie? How you doing? Um, my name's Matt, and um, I'm a grateful recovering addict. Um, three years ago, you know, drugs and alcohol had brought me to a place where I felt alone, uh, I, I felt hopeless, and I um, knew I needed help. Three years ago, I entered SCAD detox facility and I was heading to a program, uh, Stonington Institute. So I just want to take a, a quick moment to know where Matt's mission reached out and helped me. And through a family member that knew Kathy, um, reached out to her and said, hey, can you help my Maddie? And she had said to them back, I might not be able to save my Maddie, but we'll try and save yours. And in that moment, I felt, I, t I teared up. It touched me, and for someone to care about where I was at the time um, meant everything. And I just want to take a moment. Kathy, thank you for help save my life. Thank you very much. Addiction and drugs and alcohol had brought me to a place um, where I never thought I would be. And fighting that stigma, personally, you feel like you're alone. Um, I felt alone. I, um, I needed help and I knew it, but I fought it every step of the way. Um, I, I, my addiction slowly progressed from uh, Dr um, drinking and smoking pot to harder drugs and harder drugs and slowly along the way um, you just justify it or I just justified it um, for me I'm no different than any pitcher on that hill I'm no better or anything like that um, that very easily could have been me um, and that's how serious it is to me that's how serious I need it to be for me um, what, what I needed was help and I, I just knew that, um, and through Lebanon Pines and, and programs like this, I was able to get that and, and support from my family. I was able to receive what I needed and finally, um, necessarily come out on the other side of it and, and fight for the cure, um, fight fight on the right side of addiction. Um, I, drugs and alcohol took me to a point where I didn't participate in my life anymore. Um, I didn't play sports. I didn't do the things I loved. I 
wasn't being a good brother, a son, um, an uncle, all everything I had in my life um, slowly was taken away from me, and I I knew it, and I just didn't know where to how to get it back. Um, and and through recovery, I've grown so much. I I needed to be around people in AA, Alcoholics Anonymous, and Narcotics Anonymous um, that are fighting the same fight as me. Um, I have a network of, of many people in my life today um, that help me when, when thoughts come into my head. You know, um, I put the stigma on myself that, you know, i um, afraid to be different than my friends or my family. Uh, for a long time, I, I, that stigma kept me out drinking and drugging. I didn't know um, how to change, you know? Um, and slowly but surely, things, things started to turn around for me. Um, I'm grateful to be here today. You know, um, three years ago, I, I wouldn't have thought this. Like the speaker before me said, I, w I wouldn't have been able to speak in, in front of anybody. Um, sobriety has given me so much. All my relationships in my life are significantly better. Everything, from, from top to bottom. I'm reliable. Um, family can count on me. And it used to not be that way. I enjoy being reliable. I, I'm proud to be sober. For a long time, I wasn't. I was ashamed, I thought I was different. I thought, you know, hey, you know, poor me. You know, I can't drink. Poor me, I can't, you know, enjoy myself. Sobriety has allowed me to enjoy myself more now than ever before. Um, I'm proud of who I'm becoming. And through things like Matt's mission and other programs, and other things out there, I truly believe for the first time in my life that I can go do anything I want as long as I don't drink or use drugs. Um, addiction has affected me personally, many friends in my life, a few on that hill, a few still going through it. And for me, what it took was to finally surrender to that stigma. I did not like to be called an alcoholic. I did not like to be called an addict. But that acceptance for me was the beginning to a whole new life. And moving forward, I just am proud of who I'm becoming and thankful and grateful for things like this and friends and family and people in my life that allow me to have always supported me and allowed me to become the person I am today. So thank you very much. Thank you, Matt. And it's, please know, it is so important that you sh share your experience, strength, and hope with others so that they would know that you can have a very good life and do anything you want when you're not encumbered by the addiction. Next is Peter H. Is Peter here? Huh? Peter's not here then. We're moving right to the end, but I do not want to finish up without hear from hearing from Donald O. Donald? Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name's Donald Woolett. I'm a Jewett City guy. Class of 72. Yeah, dude. Kathy, here for you. I couldn't make the uh, reunion because I was at Natchog Hospital. Thank you, Natchog. Um, I now have a certificate saying I am tested and I do have a mental illness. Okay, how did I get there? Really quick. See this nice facility in 1995? I was the fire chief who allowed this to happen. There was a big mill here. It's all gone. Nice, beautiful park. Notice it doesn't have my name on it. Thank God. Another, another town, someone by the name of McKeon has that, but not me. Um, 1995 was a good year. Also, it was the beginning of me 
I guess, self-analyzing myself, was my main, my manic depression started. I was on a high in 1995. After this building, I saved most of these buildings on the side, me and 556 other firefighters, all proud of them, first responders, EMS, um, Salvation Army. It was, it was a community effort. Um, next year, it's 25 years, and I, geez, just like it happened yesterday. I lived over there. I actually could wake up every morning and said, boy, if that mill takes off, boy, it's going to be a fire. It was. It was the largest in the state of Connecticut. Also going on in 1995, I worked for the state of Connecticut, like Kath. Um, I worked for Public Works. I don't need my notes anyway. And I had five major projects going on, worth about 200 million bucks. Got them all done successfully. After I became fire chief, uh, somebody came up to me and said, hey, you just do such job, good job running the fire department, how about running the borough? And I got elected as borough warden. Arlene, I took over for Arlene Maynard's dad. Uh, my daughter, very proud of her, Kate. She's a music director up at Turtle Lot High School. She's got the same problem I have, a mental illness. And uh, runs in the family, depression is rampant. Plus I got PTSD. Um, I got hired by the Connecticut Fire Academy. It's not bad enough I was working for Public Works. Let's go out and teach, which I love doing. I love instructing other firefighters. Lessons learned. Don't let a big mill get you down. I'm known throughout Connecticut, and I was published nationally, so everybody knows how many mill fires I've been at. <sighs> also, uh, got uh, very fortunate to attend the National Fire Academy down in Emmitsburg, Maryland. And I got to have dinner with the uh, president, not of the United States, but one of his uh, top men. I was very honored to have that. So all was well. Um, took over as Borough Warden. The first thing I met was the ACLU. Get the kids off the sidewalks, they said. Well, I'm going to do that. First Amendment. I learned. Um, so I uh, was warden for eight years, was fire chief for 21 years. I lived here for all my life until 17 years ago, then I moved out. I moved to Franklin, where I love it. I'm out in the middle of nowhere, next to the golf course there that the Mohegan tribe owns. Uh, but what I didn't know was all this good times started becoming bad. I couldn't say no to anybody. Don, can you do this? Sure. Don, can you do that? Sure. Well, all that stress, stressors started up. Uh, then a guy named Malloy, no disrespect to the politicians, but I'm going to. He said, uh, do more with nobody. I need you to get all these projects done. Well, I need people. I'm, oh, by the way, I'll make you the boss. How did, become a, how did I become a boss? My boss committed suicide. A year after I became boss, one of my subordinates committed suicide. Oh, boy, you're starting to hear a little ring on this. Uh, three years ago, September 2016, I went to Hartford and tried the same thing. Blood everywhere, noontime, big mission. I, I thought it was my fault that the fire schools weren't being built. It wasn't my fault. It was Malloy Incorporated. Not, and not Jack. Jack, it wasn't your fault. Okay. So, uh, <laughs> um, and luckily, two of my subordinates, I locked myself in a room. I won't go into gory details, but they're gory and uh, tried to end my life. Why? I have no clue. Maybe because of some of the meds that a certain, not Hartford Healthcare, but a certain other agency filled me full of prescription drugs. So I woke up after the Lord said, hey, you can't come in yet. You're not invited. It's not your time. So I woke up to see three guys from the city of Hartford, Agent One, said, Chief, you're not going to die on us, dude. you got more things to teach us. So I, I recovered, Hartford Hospital. They sent me to the IOL. Spent a week there, and the first thing they did is they took me off the damn drugs. It made me pretty good. And then I went to the wrong place, and I won't mention it. I found somebody that said she was a noise in Vietnam, and you needed more pills. Whoa. I felt like a zombie for two and a half years. Couldn't get out of my bed. Couldn't get out of anything. Scared of life. Me? 
Not me. I'm Don Willette. Look at me. I'm a superstar in my mind. Well, then my wife and my family really did wonders and said, why don't we try medical marijuana? Because nothing else works. So I did. Hey, dudes, the 70s was back. Bernie's, Bernie, the weekend at Bernie's. Medical marijuana, good stuff, just don't have anybody to tell you how to prescribe it. So I started at the high end, and I ended up crashing, becoming manic. That's how I got to be over at Natchog for two weeks, where finally somebody said, hey, you're suffering PTSD. You're suffering from manic depression. Hey, get off all these damn drugs. What you need to do is sleep at night. And during that time, I met all these people addicted to drugs, addicted to mental health problems. It's all interconnected. Natchog did a great job. They wouldn't let me go because I kept fighting them. And I finally said, maybe if I comply, I could go home. That's how I missed my uh, reunion. I was supposed to cook the chicken. Thanks, guys, for El Botello. Thanks for cooking the chicken for me. <sighs> anyway, I sit here today. Uh, I'm now a part of the program, Recovery, down at Bacchus Hospital, and they're tremendous. I see my friends from American Ambulance. I see these guys transport in Bacchus every day. And I'd say 70% of their work is people with mental health or addiction problems. It's, it's making the cash register ring, but it's, it's depressing as hell. So finally in ending, I hope you like the park because the state of Connecticut did one thing right. They gave us a lot of money to make it a nice park. DEP did something good for a change. Um, I just want people to realize that it's okay to have stigma, you know, but you don't lock up mentally ill like John Rowland did. Let's throw everybody in uh, a certain mental health institute. Let's get rid of all the mental health and let's put them on the street without help. And then when and you wonder why people get addicted to drugs. So in ending, I want to thank Kathy and, and all the people at Matt's mission. I have my own little mission. It's, it's to help the first responder community. And, uh, I'm on a nationwide uh, internet, okay, through Facebook. Uh, we're taking care of peers, and it's okay. I've already dumped my bucket there, but I'm filling up with good things. One thing I learned, one of the tools, dump the bucket, fill it up with good things. So thank you very much. Have a great day. The sun's coming out. Thank you, Don. Thank you for sharing your experience, strength, and hope. Now, finally, I'd like to call up April... April Wojcik? April? Oh, is someone from Perception here? How can it save lives? Give us a couple of minutes, would you please? What's your name? I'm Stephen. Stephen. I'm Stephen from Perception Programs Outreach. Um, so, if you come to our booth, I do have some Narcan I can actually give out today. Um, and one of the things that my department does is we run the harm reduction program for perception programs, which covers Wyndham County and now Norwich as well. So that means that we run the syringe service program. So we are trying to help people who are still in the throes of addiction use safely as much as possible so that when they're actually ready to make the change, they're still there for it, to actually make that change. And we're there to also help provide resources so that when they're ready to make that change, We've got the numbers, we've got the connections to actually get them into treatment and get them the help they need. So um, that's really the quick overview for uh, us. Um, and like I said, I do have some Narcan with me today up at the table, up near the stage. So if people feel they need Narcan, I have it. And if I run out, I do have more in my office. So you can take my card and I can make sure you get some later. So thank you, Stephen. Thank you for what you do. April, April Wojcik. And the leader of this organization, Matt's mission, Kathy Duffesey. Hello. I would like to congratulate one of our board members, Jack Malone, and I hope I get this right, Jack, on 9,573 days, which equals to 26 years in 11 
no, in 83 days in recovery. So that's 26 years and 83 days in recovery, 9,573 days. Come on up, Jack. Thank you, Jack, for your unwavering support and leadership, assisting Matt's mission to move forward with their goals. You made a lasting and permanent contribution to Matt's mission. You hold us up, you guide us, and you make us shine with much appreciation for your endless contribution of time. We love you, Jack. Thank you. It represents, uh, recognizes, in grateful recognition of your dedication, compassion, and commitment to Matt's mission. This is pretty special. This is the deal. My name is Jack, I'm an alcoholic, and I've been sober since 6.15 this morning. And what that means is that Today's the day I got working for me. Today's the day I have to stay sober. I got a lot of years of waking up sober. I did pretty good yesterday. Didn't come close. Tomorrow I got no guarantee. But if I use the tools that I have today and all those days behind me, I can have a life and have a life that is, you know, if I can give it to somebody else and show somebody else. You know, there's some people out there that say, Malone, Malone can get sober. I can do it, and if that's, that's okay. Before I get shushed by Aaron, I just want to say this as we conclude. At the start of the event today, and I thank you all for being here, uh, we were blessed to hear the original song written by Dave Drobiak called The Mets Mission Song. Well, what we've learned is that Dave has written another Matt's mission song that we want to share with you today and we want to thank Dave for all that he's done. Oh, Daryl, you're here. Where you been? Come here, come here, speak, because people want to hear you talk. But just very briefly, because we're done. We're over time. Hello everyone, my name is Daryl McGraw. Sorry I'm late, but I got to be a dad today. I had to do some Ubering with my kids. You know, and I say that, you know, um, so my clean date, I like to say, I have to always remember because it was the last time that I was in the back of a police car. It was the last time that I put a substance in my body. It was May 7, 2007. I like coming after Jack because Jack is a role model. You guys can clap for that. You know, today is, today is a good day for me. Recovery month is a very good month. There's like, you know, we have an opportunity to be here and um, show that recovery works because the community, so many people says that th it just doesn't work. This doesn't exist. Why should we help those addicts? They, they, can't, they need to pull themselves up by their own bootstraps. You know, I remember when I didn't have boots, so I couldn't pull myself up. But it was, this is a community thing and it was, if it wasn't for people like Matt's Mission, CCAR, and many other other the other tables that I see here, I wouldn't be able to stand here and say today that I got to drop my son off at his game and drop a couple of cheerleaders off before I got here. So I apologize for being late. I didn't know there was a formal list, but I see they're getting better and better every year. Um, my apologies for being late, but I would never miss this event. This is very important for me, and this actually helps me stay clean. So Jack told me to be brief. And I will end with, you know, thank you for supporting everyone that's in recovery and know that this is possible because now what you're looking at is I used to be a dope dealer, but now you're looking at a hope dealer. And I deal hope everywhere I can, everywhere I can. So let's enjoy this day. Remember the ones that, that um, didn't make it through the fight, and we're still fighting for those as well. I have to always speak for those individuals that are still incarcerated those people that were incarcerated due to their substance use and not knowing that this thing is possible. Many times I was in and out of prison and after getting out of prison on June 10th, June 10th, 2010, with a five year plan and six notebooks. And I, I got out of there and someone said yes, somebody gave me a job and they said yes. Despite all the stuff that I had, all the records that I had before, they said, you know what, we're going to give you a shot. And that shot led to me standing here today. So I just want to say thank you. Thank you, Daryl.
Guy used to have no boots. Now he's got a pretty neat pair of Nikes. Cool color, too. Mike. Mike's going to play the newest version, the new song that Dave Drobiak was so kind to craft for us. The next... Can I come up here? Yeah. Come on up, Dave. Yeah. Dave Drobiak. We're going to hear his song. We heard it before. We're going to hear another one. Thank you, Dave. Thanks, Jack. I'll be quick because I know it's been a long day with talking. Uh, when I decided to write the Matt's Mission song, uh, I wanted to do it for being my, you know, friends with Ke uh, Kathy, Kelly, and the members of the Matt's Mission board. Um, I got to thinking. I couldn't imagine how it could be uh, losing a child to addiction, uh, not only losing any loved one to addiction. So my point with Matt's mission was to uh, kind of get a, my thoughts on how what, what Kathy must be going through and then kind of bring, bring forth what Matt's mission is about, their mission. Uh, this new song I wrote is really, uh, it's kind of should have been written first. It's a prelude. I kind of hop on anxiety and depression and, you know, with the hopes that it, you're not gonna, it doesn't lead to the addiction pot and something worse. Um, it's called Don't Cross the Line. Um, and uh, basically it's crossing the line to hopefully don't cross the line to addiction. So I hope you enjoy it and uh, I hope you can interpret it the way you way I did. So, Mike. Thanks, Dave. <laughs>
Okay, everyone, don't leave. I'd like CC to speak about her next event at Tamarack. It's a great event, lots of fun, lots of music. Thanks, Kat, for a few seconds at the microphone. I was just charging her, and she decided to announce me. So <laughs> I love the way you operate. Um, thank you, everyone, today for being here, and to Matt's mission for the wonderful work they do. It's so nice to collaborate with the other organizations that are doing everything they can to bring awareness, to reduce shame and stigma, and to um, just make this journey so that all of us together are working toward the same goal. We've all suffered loss. I don't how many of you out there are here because you have a loved one on the hill. Raise your hand if you're here to honor somebody that's got their photo here. It's um it's something we're in together. So just don't ever feel alone. Next Sunday, uh September fifteenth is a music festival at Tamarack Lodge. Um, it's going to fundraise for TriCircle Inc., which is an organization that's really trying hard in three phases to create real long-term solutions for families and individuals that are affected by substance use disorders and the disease of addiction. We would love to see all of you there. If you all round up 300 of your closest friends, it's going to be the best day of the year, besides this one maybe. And um, I actually let Kathy off the hook because I want her there with a booth. And she said, um, <laughs> I think I'm just going to relax. So she's going to get spotlighted that day, but she's going to be sitting in a lawn chair with a well-deserved relaxation in order. So thanks, thanks everybody, and we'll see you in next Sunday, the 15th. Thank you, Susie. Wow. Thank you everyone for coming today, but don't leave yet. We have an amazing raffle, which includes a smart TV. If you haven't already received your raffle tickets, please see Jane Panis. I believe she's back there selling tickets. And also please visit our food trucks. There's some amazing food over there from Elba Pabone. And there's also an ice cream truck for the kids. There's hula hooping. And please visit all our resource tables for treatment options. Thank you, everyone, for coming today.